Dear ChatGPT, what is the next item for my roguelike game? Sincerely, Sticky. Dear Sticky, considering the nature of roguelike games, where each play... I uh, don't actually care, just tell me what the item is. Blah, 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 blah. Mirror sheet. Okay, great. Uh, really creative AI. Not definitely not stealing directly from the Legend of Zelda. Definitely uh, completely original and uh, very thoughtful of the AI. going on guys in this video i'm going to be showing you how you can add this shield to your game so this model that i've made is available in the description of the video for free you could just go ahead and download it if you want to i've obviously put it into my item pool because it's an item that i'm going to be using in my game and so basically when you walk into the shield picks up the shield and it puts this picture in the top left corner if you right click it it uses the shield effect which you can see looks pretty awesome. Now I've set the cooldown to something kind of unrealistic. It's only like 10 seconds and it one shots everything. So it's not really a good cooldown. Let me just see if I can find some enemies. All right, here we go. So we could just hit one shots everything it touches. It doesn't one shot bosses though. Um, there's like a check. And if you've already hit a monster with it, it won't hit it multiple times. So I'm going to show you all the code that I use for it as well. But uh, yeah, I think it's a pretty cool effect. It's like a really, really awesome active item. And I think these items are just getting better and better. So I hope you guys will stay to the end of the video. And like I said, this will be available to download in the description of the video for free. I'm going to be exporting it as a package, which means that the visual effect will be attached to the package. So you don't even have to make it if you don't want to. You can just download the package. And if you double click on it, you can open it into your game and it will have everything required for you to just start using it. So when you bring the shield into your game, it will look like this. I've obviously attached it to the front of my character. So it's attached to a bone on my character. So when he moves his hand around, follows his hand. Uh, so if you want the same effect, you'll have to attach it to a bone. So for example, this is my character. I have an armature and this is his bone. And then he has the staff, which is usually there. And then he has his shields which this gets activated. So there's two versions of the shield. I mean, it's the same shield, but there's two sets of materials for the shield and it affects how it looks. So this is how the shield looks by default. And this is the way I'm going to export it that you're able to see it. But when you activate the shield, it will look like this. And then there's this visual effect. I've turned it off just for right now. Okay. Yeah. So this visual effect will get exported as well. And uh, this is exactly what you saw in like the demo of me using it. So I'm going to open up the visual effect so you can see what it looks like. And I'll go over like how it's working. Okay. So there's particle systems inside of this visual effect graph. This one on the left, this is these, these beams of light that are shooting out of the shield. And this one on the right is like these little particles that are coming out like around the base of the shield. So I've set the rate to 1000, which is a constant spawn rate and the capacity to 20,000. Uh, this could maybe be a little bit less, but I guess it doesn't really matter. The velocity is really small because these are not actually like moving. I mean, they are moving, but they're not moving very fast. Like they're barely moving at all. Uh, these are long strips. So like if we change this to one, you could see what one looks like. So you can see like it's just one long strip that goes out like this. So let me just change it back to 20,000. Okay, so then we're setting the scale, um, which is... The scale basically means you can set like the X, the Y, and the Z. So if you click on the object and you click on these like little arrows, you can see that there's Y, which is the one that we're modifying, and then Z is up and down, and then X is like left and right. So we're setting the Y to be 50, which is what turns it into the long line instead of it just being like a, a circular or um, spherical object, right? And then we're setting the size to 0.2, so it's really small, but it's really long. Then we're setting the lifetime to be 1 to 3. This doesn't matter. You could technically make this a little bit longer. Like, if you're having bad performance, you could make less of these particles, like, turn it down by a lot, and then turn up the lifetime, because these don't really, like... I guess the more particles, the more variation you can see. So every, like, 1 to 3 seconds, a new line will generate or whatever, but 
the, I mean, it's up to you. If you do a higher lifetime and a lower particle count, you'll get better performance. Um, and th- okay. So then in the update particle, we're setting the pivot, um, sorry, pivot or pivot. I, I'm not too sure, but anyway, basically we're, we're taking 0.5 off it in the Y axis. So let me open paint so I can explain this. So let's say we have a, oh shit. Okay. Let's say we have a particle like this, right? Um, can I make this bigger? No. Okay, whatever, we'll just ignore that. So let's say we have a particle like this, right? So the pivot point for a particle or anything is right in the center by default, right? Now, when we stretch this or send it out, we don't want it going from the center like this, right? Because the pivot point is here. So we want the pivot point to be at the bottom of the particle. So it doesn't matter what the size of the particle is. This is 0.5. So like 0.5. This is one and this is negative 0.5. Okay. So we're setting the pivot point to be negative 0.5 because we want it to start here and we don't want it to start here. Okay. So because these beams of light, this particle is getting stretched. And if we don't set the pivot point, what will happen is this. So the pivot points here, right? And they're still going to go out like, but there's going to be a lot of lines that come out, but let me just change. Let me just turn off the pivot point so you can understand. Let me just type zero here. See, so there's half on the bottom side and half on the top side. So if you stretch something, if you want it to move upwards to like where, like change the starting point to the the bottom of it, you need to put negative 0.5 here. So that's what pivot does or pivot or whatever. the Okay, it's actually pivot. I just heard so many YouTubers say pivot and I'm just, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, okay, so that, I guess that doesn't really matter. So, so this is what generates these lines and this is the main part of this. And I'm just using the default particle system. So you have this one by default. So if you just type in default here, it's uh, it's this top one. Okay, so then the, the default particle actually looks this good, believe it or not. And then the co- I've set the color over lifetime to be a bright yellow. So it's yellow with intensity 3.9. Yeah, this is the default gradient. So everything's the same except for this last E I've changed to 3.9. And I might have changed this too. I don't know. Let me change, check it. No, I, this is the default. So then after that, we're orienting it along the velocity. If you don't do this, the default is to face the camera position and... Yeah, so it looks like like it's they're not facing the direction that they're going. So anytime you have like a thing that you're stretching, usually you'll use a long velocity. And then we got all these like little particles coming up from the bottom, okay? So that's this particle system over here. So if you right click inside the visual effect graph, you can create a node and then choose system and then simple particle system. I've changed the spawn rate to 5,000 and the ca- capacity to 25,000. The velocity is really fast on the Y axis. So again, if you click on this, you can see there's the three axes, right? So it's 20 on the Y axis, but the lifetime is only 0.5, like 0.25 to 5. So even though it's going really fast in the Y axis, these are disappearing so fast that it doesn't make it to the end of the thing. Uh, you can obviously play with these numbers if you want. And I've set the size to be very, very small. And um, yeah, in the X and sorry, the X and the Z, and that's left and right and up and down. So it's only going 0.5 to 0.5 up and down and only 0.3, or sorry, three to three. And so this is X and this is Z. So Z is like up and down. So vertically, it's only going up and down a little bit. So I don't know if you can see that, but it's like just a little bit of variation. Now this is completely flat. So this isn't really appropriate for a 2D or a 3D game where you're like actually um, playing third person or something. This is only good for top down because you're looking at it top down. You can't see that it's completely flat. So you don't even really know if you were playing in like um, a 3D game, you would want to just make the Z a lot more. So you could do like three and negative three or like, sorry, that's only for, um, so you would want to do that in the, this velocity. So this Z number, you could change this Z number. So I would do like negative one to one or whatever so then you get like this kind of like burst but obviously the number would have to be way less than that so just maybe like 0.2 and and 0.2 here and even less than that probably would be better so i'm just gonna maybe zero one let me just see if i can get this to actually work the way i want it 
Yeah, so then it's a little bit more spread out, like vertically. But if you start doing that, you're going to want to add more lines because it'll take away from it. So we're not going to do that because we're looking top down. So we're never going to see it from that angle anyway. But um, yeah, you might be using not top down in your game. So then I have the blend mode set to alpha and they're both set to alpha. And then I have the same exact gradient as the other one where I've just changed this to yellow and it's 3.5. And then I think the white at the beginning is... Okay, so I have a little bit of intensity on the white at the beginning, but um, this is pretty straightforward. And again, it's along velocity. This doesn't really matter because these are all circular. So if you change this, it won't change anything. Like, it's, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm going to leave it as a long velocity, but you don't have to do that. Like I said at the beginning, I'm exporting this as part of this. So you don't actually have to set this up if you don't want to. If you just import the one that I'm going to export, you can just import it into your game and it will come with this already set up. But uh, yeah, some important things to learn, like the, the pivot and that kind of stuff is always worth taking a look at. So I'm going to get out of this and I'm going to save this. And I'm going to show you the script that I'm using to make this detect enemies and collide with enemies. Okay, so this is the script. Um, you could technically use a ray cast and cast in different angles in front of the shield, right? So like you could cast rays in front of the shield. The visual effects graph cannot detect collisions, okay? So when you're using an item that's using a visual effect graph, you have to come up with a different way to detect collisions. And there's lots of ways that you could do it. You could set up a game object that has the same size as this and have it not have a, um, what's it called, a mesh renderer. You could have a no renderer. So you could set up like a triangle or like a, a shape that takes up this area and then you could add a box collider or a collider to it, a mesh collider to it and try to do it that way. But um, what I've done is this. So I have a list of enemies in my game. So all of my enemies are inheriting from this abstract class. Okay. So if you don't have an abstract class, what you could do is all of your enemies, you could make them have a tag. So you could tag them as enemy or you could put them on an enemy layer or you could do something to indicate that they're enemies. You could add an object to them that's an enemy object, or you could add a script to them, even if you add a script that is um, enemy or something like that, where they all inherit from the same script, then you could check for that script here. So what I'm doing, because all of my enemies inherit from this abstract enemy class, um, I can check if they are an enemy. So this code, so uh, this is the fixed update. This will only be happening when my mirror shield is activated. So when I right click on my keyboard or on my uh, mouse, it activates the mirror shield. So in my actual game, if you look here, this shield is not active by, by default. So let me just show you my stick man, wherever he is. Yeah, there he is, right? So you've got the stick man and he's usually holding the staff, right? So when I press right click, what it does is it activates this mirror shield and all of the settings are set up by default so that he will, like, it will start shooting this immediately, right? And this script will start right because this code is running on fixed update. When this is not active, this won't do anything. But when this is active, it will be running this in fixed update, right? So this is getting all of the objects in my game. Um, so this is not viable if you have too many objects in your scene, okay? So if you have like, thousands and thousands of objects in your scene you're going to be better off with like a ray cast or something like that but because i don't ever have that many objects in my scene i only ever have like a certain number of objects in the scene um i'm just getting all of the objects and i'm trying to get the enemy component of each object and if i do get so if i do get the enemy component from the object i am um checking if the the uh, angle of my player so, so this is my player here, right? This is my player's position, which is captured in a static class. You would want to use the angle of your shield or whatever object you have attached to this. And I'm checking if the angle from my player to the enemy is less than 0.80% uh, away. So I'm calculating the dot product, which I know that sounds kind of ca uh, complicated, but I'm calculating the dot product, which is the two uh, vectors multiplied together. And so... Let me just show you in paint because I don't know how to verbally explain this very well. So this is my player right here, right? And this is the enemy that we've found is an enemy in the scene. So this is the, if, if they're looking the same direction, then the angle would be um, zero degrees or whatever, right? There's zero. Um, so it has up to 20% 
uh, or ten percent on each side, I guess. It has about twenty percent leniency. So if it's about twenty percent away, if it's less than twenty percent away from the enemy, then it will hit the enemy. So we'll subtract twenty nine from the enemy's health, and we'll damage the enemy using a script that I already have made to hit the enemy. It also adds this. So we've got this hash set of enemies that have already been hit by your shield, right? And it adds the enemy, their instance ID, to this hash set. And it, it checks it each time. So if you're, like, like, let's say you're in the boss room, right? You don't want it to hit the boss 80 times in a row and kill the boss immediately. You only want it to do a maximum of 30 damage to the boss. And then you have to kill the boss, like, the rest of the damage to the boss the normal way. A hash set is the best container when you use the contains method, okay? So anytime you're using contains, you should use a hash set to store the values because this is going to give you the fastest lookup time for this value, right? So this is, um, just think of it like a list, except for hash sets better for contains than a list is. Anyway, so it, it will add the enemy to, like, the instance ID of the enemy to this hash, hash set, and then it will damage the enemy so that their shield can't damage it multiple times. So... This is how I detected the collision with the enemy. Like I said, you could tag the enemy or you could put it into a layer and then you could check if the object is on that layer or part of the tag. But because all of my enemies inherit from this abstract class, I don't have to do that. So I probably lost everyone who's watching this because that's really confusing. And um, yeah, it's pretty confusing. But I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And if you did, make sure you like and subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next one.